It's wonderful to see you again, and I am really excited to get started with our conversation. You can unmute yourself now. <laughs> I, I actually did. So, <laughs> surprisingly, thanks, Jill. It's a, it's a pleasure to to be uh, uh, to be asked to be a part of this, and and also to to see you again and to chat with you again. It's been a while. Exactly. Okay. Well, listen. Let's. I, I gave a very, very brief uh, overview of, of you and your career and, and what you're doing now. But can you tell us in a bit more detail? I love your backdrop. This is you're already communicating the key work that you do at Cubic Farms. But tell us um, a bit more about Cubic Farms and your role there. Yeah. I mean, Cubic Farms. You know, we're a local chain ag tech company, and you know, we make two uh, grow controlled environment agricultural systems indoor systems. One grows uh, uh, produce, uh, lettuce, herbs, microgreens, and uh, the other grows uh, live uh, um, livestock feed to, to feed uh, cattle and, and, and dairy uh, cows. And uh, all our technology, uh, you know, the, the impetus, the creation of all our technology is really uh, from farmers. And so it's technology invented by farmers which uh, uh by, and, found, and founded by farmers and so you know when when we think about local chain ag tech it, it sounds like an you know I, when we were talking you're like what is that well you know it's really about disrupting the local supply chains and what we saw over the course of the last couple of years and we continue to see is our supply chains are vulnerable and they're at risk and uh you know in canada uh, you know I'm, almost all of our lettuce comes from salinas california and uh, wouldn't it be amazing if we could grow all our lettuce internally, cut down all the trucks coming across the border, um, and then get produce that is fresh and, uh, on your shelf that has been grown two days before instead of three weeks before or four weeks before. So uh, that's really the goal of our company is to, is to bring that kind of technology to folks so that we can be sustainable uh, locally. Um, and then in my role, you know, I, I, I joined uh, uh, Cubic Farms as a CTO. Uh, you know, the, the role of CTOs, typical of most CTOs, is really drive the vision and build the team uh, for our technology uh, as, as, you know, as we grow and build out, have the vision for that. Then, um, uh, you know, I, I love more pain. So I took on the role of a, a, pre, uh, a president, uh, which really uh, allows me to focus on a lot of our internal functions while Dave, our CEO, uh, focuses on external functions uh, of the company. So yeah, it's been exciting. It sounds amazing. And uh, I do feel like I could just reach out and pluck some of that lettuce. <laughs> From time to time, I may reach back and snack if that's okay with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Now, I do imagine, though, that it would be a bit of a big change going from uh, you know, Microsoft in a downtown location, a global company and that Redmond focus, and then uh, now to be uh, leading a local ag tech company. So tell us about some of, um, uh, of the learnings in that transition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 is, a, it is a big move, you know. Um, you know, and I, I, I reflect back on my career and, and most of the time, almost all the time I've been, apart from my stint at Rogers, which I noticed uh, Rogers sponsored this event. I used to work for Rogers, wonderful company uh, back in the day. And uh, I've always been with early stage companies and before Microsoft worked with, uh, uh, you know, uh, many startups in the video game space. And then going to Microsoft, I ended up on an early stage technology within Microsoft. And, um, and 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 stayed there for you know for ten years and and you know it, it's kind of funny I it is sort of the necessary journey I think for a technologist and um, and, and why is because the things I learned at Microsoft you can't learn at an early stage startup and so uh, what what I learned is to understand what it really means to scale and understand the technological infrastructures that are necessary in order to scale, you don't kind of get that experience uh, uh, at, at, a, at a small scale company, uh, you know, so that was one of the the realizations sort of I made when I when you walk in and then when you hire people from those larger organizations, I'm not saying that that's what I'm doing. I'm just saying that that could happen. And when you bring in those people into your early stage company, they have the confidence to know where to go to get to to get to be a global organization because they've already done that. And I think 
that's a, a a really you know we've talked about this before uh you and i and and, and others in the community that you know a well uh, sort of serviced uh, technology ecosystem is one that has a healthy uh, amount of startups uh, and a healthy amount of multinationals and everything in between because you know folks never stay in one spot and over time that those kinds of skills and knowledge that are grown in each one of those uh, um, kinds of uh, companies all uh, amalgamate to success over time and i think that you know a great and that's that's been a great advantage for me in moving to the to uh, uh to cubic as i bring all that sort of enterprise SaaS experience that you can get from microsoft sap and your amazons and so it's been a uh, uh, that's been my journey sort of and and then it's been that i love the autonomy of the smaller uh, organizations and the chaos uh, uh you know and in the fast pace um I, I don't enjoy chasing funds uh you didn't have to do that at microsoft but you went a little bit slower at microsoft but but uh um but you know everyone has their advantages and disadvantages and it's really about where you're at in your career and your time in life and managing that over time so it's been uh it's been good i love that uh that analogy that a sort of healthy ecosystem has a healthy life cycle, right? And so, yeah, nobody works in one company for their entire careers, and it can be mutually enriching. The one thing I'm really proud about in this ecosystem is the community spirit, because I think that's one thing that really distinguishes BC from other places around the world, where uh, there is a genuine partnership between multinational startups and all sizes in between, and we're trying to build a better BC together. Um, it's it's something special that doesn't have to happen, but it happens because of leaders like you and companies like yours, both your former company and today's company, wanting and seeing the benefits of working together. So it's exciting. And and now, as you were saying, you're a customer of Microsoft. Yes, yes, yeah. I saw John Hitzman on the list there. So <laughs> hi, John. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, now Cubic Farms is primarily known as an ag tech company, um, but as you were describing your software, it's also a, a, a supply chain disruption company. So um, tell us a little bit more about that and how your technology really enables that localization, that local chain um, to be realized. Yeah, I mean, how we, you know, let's, let's take, um, yeah, let's take our, our Cubic Farm system as sort of a, a a description. I mean, I touched on it a, a, a little bit with, uh, you know, uh, uh, our, our most of our lettuce coming from California. So, you know, what happens there, you've got a head of lettuce comes out of the ground, you know, and, and then gets shipped up to, uh, to Canada, you know, there's two weeks, two to three weeks, I think for that process to happen. So, you know, heads of lettuce stay in a cooler and uh, uh, they all come up across the border, they get here, they go to, you know, uh, you know, Richmond, a processing plant, and then they, they become, you know, part of your, you know, hamburgers or sandwiches that you have at whatever, uh, you know, restaurant that is purchasing this. But by the time it gets to that uh, uh, processing plant, it sits in a cooler for another week for pathogen tests. Then it goes to the processing plant and then it comes out and they throw half it away because half it went run. And then it gets processed and then it gets in your sandwich or your hamburger, right? So that's almost like a four week journey for lettuce to get to you. How can lettuce be fresh or taste good that long? You know, and we sort of been conditioned to this, right? Well, what our systems allow us to do, specifically, uh, you know, our, our hub that, that we're designing today is, is that it allows you to process at scale, commercial scale, a large, uh, you know, amount of lettuce that can feed those processing plants locally, cutting out all the trucks. And then as soon as it's ready, it goes straight to that processing plant to get processed. So the time from harvest, the time to the processing plant could be as, as short as a day, depending on your logistics to get it there. So now the shelf life of that, you know, vegetable is way longer. You know, like I took a, a package of our microgreens home the other day. It, it's six weeks, it's in my fridge. Wow. And usually when you go buy microgreens, I mean, it's terrible. You know, you got to eat it within a day or two uh, because it won't last. And so that's that's the power of, of being local, you know, and I think there's a statistic I heard on a, on a podcast of the day, like 15 to 20 percent of the emissions that are uh, uh, in, in Canada 
are generated from food processing and uh, food um, uh, transport logistics. And so that's how our, our system really, you know, moves you toward being local for freshness, food security and quality, right? And then at the same time, you know, we reduce those, uh, those environmental impacts that happen because of our long supply chain. That's really interesting. So staying on the climate piece for a bit, because I know that that's, it's, it's, both a values, um, a really important value for, for Cubic Farms, but also I want to hear a bit about your um, livestock feed solution yeah. and how that works because, you know, methane is a really critically important uh, greenhouse gas as well. So tell us a bit more about that other product. Yeah, our hydrogen system. So, I mean, a hydrogen system is like sort of the the, the 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 direct answer or result of the fact that you know uh, our you know inventor, our founder uh, Nels Grohl, he he invented the system because he couldn't graze his cattle anymore uh, because uh, drought. Uh, you know, we're going through about a, I think a twenty five year drought now in the middle of the United States and you know California and the, uh, the southern West Coast is is uh is well well on their way for some time now and so what's happening is this you know beautiful green pasture that you know cattle used to go out and eat is not uh not there anymore and so what that has driven farmers to do to try to keep up their production is to bring in additives molasses and other types of 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 uh, additives to encourage the cows to eat you know dry feed which becomes super expensive and uh you know it's just cows are just like you know human beings you know the good things you put in their body the the, the better output and so um our, our inventor invented this way of growing uh, um, uh grass uh, a wheat seed uh in a platform in a barn um and it's really just lights and and water and we recycle all our water and we use very minimal lights it doesn't take that much lights to grow uh these uh what we call vertical pastures they take six days uh to grow a full pasture and you can do this 365 uh, days a year and basically you press one button the seed is grown six is laid six days later you know we have the algorithm for the exact way to coax out the highest amount of nutrients from that seed based on uh, uh, the amount of light and water that uh, uh and humidity that we generate from our system comes out the other end, gets all chopped up, drops in the trough, cows eat it. And what we've uh, managed to do uh, is, is reduce methane about, about, by about um, uh, 15 to 20%, uh, um, not 15, sorry, 20, uh, 24% uh, um, uh, reduction in methane uh, of our cattle uh, eating uh, our, our feed, which is, which is a, a staggering figure when you think about it, like uh, uh, all because you put in good food <laughs> into your body and you get a great output. And I think uh, that's a, that's really a, a, an advantage for us. So not only are we addressing uh, the challenges of climate change, but the more also um, uh, uh, our output is actually also reducing the amount of uh, uh, negative effects or outputs to the environment. So I'm really, really proud of, the, of that number. And on the cubic farm side, we, we just recently re re released some numbers because we use one rack of lights in our system and we have a patented crop motion technology. We've been we've managed to reduce energy consumption by about 54 to 62 percent compared to other vertical farms, which usually have a rack a lights, you know, uh, uh, and they stack all the, you know, so there's multiple lights in a vertical farm system. Ours is uh, is different. And and because of that, we, we we're using less energy. That's fantastic. Thank you for breaking that down for us, because it isn't intuitive what the products would be or what the benefits would be. And it's great to hear that story. So that completely resonates with me. Um, we like to think of our agricultural heritage here in British Columbia and, uh, and the wonderful things that can grow here. We know we've got a really strong tech sector, so the idea of them coming together to really empower each other is fantastic to me. Um, now tell me about that scale up journey though. So what is the challenge in scaling for cubic farms? What is it that helps you accelerate your growth? What is it that's challenging? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, on on the on the talent side what what's been interesting is is uh is manufacturing or engineering talent on the west coast is is not in abundance and you know the, a lot of that talent i think resides in the middle united states or the west or the east coast 
So that that's been a challenge, you know, that we're, we're you know we're working through uh, scaling uh, during COVID. You know, man, you know, like if you think about it, you know, the customers, like our farmers, sell you know their produce to restaurants, and restaurants were closed, you know, or reduced in 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 the volume of uh, of, of, in, of intake that they wanted to purchase. So, so for us, that 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 you know, that's a that's been a challenge. We're coming out of that now, which is super positive. Like right now, it's great. We're seeing some of the best numbers we've ever had in in the last while so that's awesome and then i think like the how to i mean a part of your question was like how do you uh stay uh, combat like how do you get to getting to scale you know one of the biggest you know things is focus and any company scaling the biggest you know demon is doing too much and um and i and i think that is just I, I've never worked in a company that never <laughs> struggles with that, but, and, and you kind of think about it, it's the same old thing, but it, it is you, when you're ambitious people, you know, in our company, everyone comes to work, you know, we're going to go change the world. You know, I, y- y- you want to do everything and you can't, you just can't. Right. And so I think, I think focus is, is really critical to scaling and, and being very measured. Um, and and understanding that as you scale, you need to slow down in other areas in order to go faster as a, as an organization, and that is really hard, especially when you are come from a you know we're a startup, build everything, go fast, move, 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 and all of a sudden now we're scaling and we're going to scale this thing incrementally, and just for everyone to understand that, stay focused on that, it takes a tremendous amount of leadership and uh, and understanding, and going back to the you know, discussion we had a little earlier about, you know, folks that are been working at these large multinationals are much more measured, right? And and so I think that that experience helps a lot when when you're thinking about scaling at, at the size uh, we're at. Yeah, it's, uh, well, you'll remember from your uh, board days at BC Tech, but I, I um, I'm always so grateful for the advice of my board members. And it's often exactly what you were saying there really focus really double down on what you're uniquely great at and just do as much of that as you can but don't get distracted Uh, exactly fantastic advice um maybe i could personalize it a little bit for you um how do you focus so how do you what what helps you to uh really uh, show that discipline on a daily basis are there particular tools or techniques or tactics or things that you do personally that the audience might benefit from learning about that enables you to see when it's time to focus and to bring that focus? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And, and I mean, it's more of a personal, I guess, answer to that. I mean, you know, I'm a, 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 a pretty passionate individual. I get into something I'm in, you know, and, and, and I, I can very easily be consumed by it. And, uh, um, and what I've learned, the older I get, what I've learned is that is that is that I need to. Uh, it sounds terrible, but care a little less. You know what I mean? Be a little matter of fact, and and really kind of break things down into pieces, and make sure that I am well rested and measured in my day. That I focus on those pieces and trust that the other pieces will come into place if I just do this and and and, and move forward in a more Pro- programmatic or systematic way, uh, rather than I got to go do this all now, you know. And I think when I was younger, I was we got to do this all now, and I'd run myself ragged, and you know I told myself the story that that it would all get done, you know that that I had to do that or else I'm not working at my peak performance. But you know, but as I've matured and realized actually i'm better by being measured and being programmatic and 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 breaking it down into pieces and trusting that it will be okay you know so i think that's been you know maybe more of a spiritual answer to that question but yeah i wasn't expecting that but that's that's that that's how i handle it i love it i i love it i see and i see complete resonance between what you were describing earlier about you know what you put into your body and the outputs there's so much to learn from athletes and there's so much to learn from farmers frankly about about that measure exactly. <laughs> that's great uh, listen i have a question from andrea in the chat uh which is great about the product so at where can people see the livestock feed machine in bc so is there any opportunity to actually see your products 
Yeah, yeah. If you uh, um, you can go to the Eco Dairy in Abbotsford and uh, uh, Bill Vanderkoy, uh, that's his uh, farm and a wonderful market there as well, where you can also purchase uh, some of the Wagyu beef that he produces that uh, all the, that cattle has been finished with our hydrogreen uh, feed. So you can actually taste the difference uh, in, in, in the quality of marbling of the actual uh, um, uh, cattle um, uh, in the meat that, uh, that he sells there. And so that's, uh, that is our uh, Canadian sort of like uh, hydrogreen system is, is installed there in Abbotsford at the Eco Dairy, right by the Costco, just off the highway. Fantastic. Okay, well, that I know what I'm doing for the week. Ken, now, so that's great. <laughs> um, listen, back to back to the company and your ambitions. And um, I'm not sure if I mentioned earlier, but we the theme for this year's TIAs is ambition because we're taken aback by the world changing ambitions of the ecosystem that we we live in, and we want to celebrate the ways in which tech companies in BC are just incredibly ambitious. So, what would be the um, ambition, the no apologies for it, ambition of cubic farms? Well, I mean, we, we want to feed a changing world. I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, if you, there is no math that, that amounts to taking our current land use in the world and say that if we turned all our land to agriculture and we, 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 it would not feed our, our, our growing population at, at the, at the way it's going. So we need to take care of our land and we need to make good use of our land and we need to continue to grow in our land. And then we need to also look at technologies like ours that will, that will address the growing population. Uh, and, and it's just inevitable as a, to survive as humans on this planet, we just have to, and we have to do it in a sustainable way. And I think that to me is, is our, is our goal. And then taking it a step further, you know, from my personally nerdy, you know, part of me, I want to democratize tools to allow people to grow anywhere in the world, 365 days a year. That's it. If you can do it here, you could do it in, in the Northwest territories. You can do it, you know, uh, at the tip of South America, you can do it in Africa. We should be able to democratize this everywhere. And so, so we're going to start in our own backyard and then we're going to, we're going to, you know, bring us across the world. Well, it's ambitious. I'm excited. <laughs> um, I got to say, one of the things that I, I love about the way you were just describing that is um, I think sometimes uh, it, there's a false narrative that there's, you know, the tech sector and then other sectors in the economy, whereas the reality for those of us who are working day to day is there's an economy, there's businesses and they're, they're all using technology. Um, to become more sustainable, to reduce their emissions, to become more efficient, to drive global sustainability and climate goals. Um, and technology is a really exciting part of that. Um, t tell me a little bit, I know you, you, would, you must have seen this when you were at Microsoft working with many, many clients, but now that you're sort of on the other side of the fence, um, what are some of the learnings that you might share with us about how technology can engage with a traditional industry like agriculture and really drive great win-win outcomes? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. It's, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think working at Microsoft and working in video games for so long, I was kind of like sheltered from the rest of the world. And I kind of just assumed that in sort of the digital transformation space or, 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 or it, where the world was at was much further ahead. And the reality is, is that, it, you know, I, I think there's a lot more work uh, that, that, that we can do uh, that, that, you know, these traditional sectors need to do in order to move faster. And um, the problem with that I've learned is that, you know, in order to move faster, you need infrastructure um, and infrastructure takes time to build. And, and, and that's where I think um, is the, you know, often uh, traditional um, sectors don't see the, it's, it's hard for them to see the, the, the fruits of that labor quickly. And it tends to be simplified to, oh, I want an app that does this thing. And then some fancy people can go make me an app. And the reality is, you know, what 
I think is going to be success. Who's going to be successful in these traditional businesses as they transform are the ones that choose to actually build solutions that are integrated and uh, which is what we're doing. We're building an integrated platform, a controlled environment, agricultural platform that's going to really drive uh, our machines, the efficiencies of our machine, but at the same time, allow us to actually take our machines global, right? If we don't build that infrastructure, you know, we won't be able to do that. And so I think that is it, it. And it was easier to see when you're in software, but it's not so easy to see when you're not in software. And I think that that's a, that's a chasm that has to kind of uh, uh, close uh, in order for, I think, for traditional uh, sectors to move faster. And it's, you know, it's not an easy thing to do because, you know, if you don't come from that world, it's not an obvious thing to see, right? So I can see where that comes from. And so I, I, I think, uh, you know, as part of your sort of technology strategy, you really need to uh, not just build peripheral uh, software or digital stuff on the side that doesn't really integrate it into your mainstream workflow or systems. You need to bring, that needs to productionize into your company fast. And I think that to me is the, the real, uh, you know, a, a rub point right now. And I think and you think in British Columbia, uh, you know, at, 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 you know, as a province, we have a lot of these traditional uh, uh, sectors, uh, the faster those sectors can move on that stuff, the m probability of British Columbia being uh, true technological leaders and building another of these pillar companies in, in the province will move faster. I love it. Yeah. But you do not need an app. You need infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. The app's on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The app's lovely, but we'll do the app in the last mile. Um, excellent. Okay. So one of the things that I uh, love about that too, is there's a real resonance with our uh, sort of talent and advocacy agenda. Cause that's, we very much say that we need in BC to be building the infrastructure of the 21st century economy. So whether that's connectivity for every community in BC, or access to education to get the skills training that you need to understand these points and work in this way. That's the kind of infrastructure that it, when governments make those investments, it really empowers the private sector and, and citizens. Exactly. If we, we need to put a farm up in northern BC, we need connectivity. We'd love to have connectivity. I mean, our system can run without connectivity, If but, but if you have connectivity, you just get more benefits of the data and 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 how your the insights that are necessary for your farm if you digitize it all. So I, I'm sorry I jumped on that because connectivity is super important. If if this province is connected, we can sell more of our equipment uh, anywhere in the province, right? Which is fantastic. And my and your former employer and my good friend Rogers thanks you for that message. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, I do want to just broaden it out a little bit. Uh, I've got one final question for you, but before I ask it, let me make sure that I've invited the audience again. Please raise your questions in the chat and I'll come to those in just a moment. But Edo, um, you've always been such a champion of BC's tech sector um, and you've worked in lots of different roles. When you look at BC right now and its tech sector, what do you think are some of the greatest opportunities for investment or growth or what are some of the words of encouragement you'd give to startups these days? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a real richness in a software talent in, in Vancouver. And I saw that evolve during my time. You know, uh, I think in, in my time, I saw, you know, that you know, we had like some of the best video game developers in the world, we still do. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, the criticism was, yeah, we don't really have, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, SaaS full stack developers, you know, the, the, the web guys, we have everything, now, you know, and I think that's a, that's a really, uh, a, a, a really, a, a wonderful thing because all that talent can translate into any sector, right. With where, where digitizing is going. So I think really positive, you know, uh, movement there. I think, um, you know, I, I think the, you know, kind of what I was talking about before about the traditional sectors. I, and I wish there would be a way to invest in those traditional sectors in a way to jumpstart them on this journey faster. And I mean, I, I'm more in ag now and I see pockets of it. And, you know, and I think some some leaders in, in the local area, like, you know, ourselves and in the folks at Terramera and, 
and uh, um, uh, Michael's company, I forget, it was at VC Tech, help me out, what's my name? Semios. Yeah, Semios. So, so like companies like that are, are 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 really showing the way, and I think I think that though investing in getting more of those companies flying, I think is is really important in the traditional sectors, and then I think some investment, you know, and I didn't I mean, actually never knew this until I started working at, at at Cubic because I was such a software guy. But what I what I did notice it's it's not easy to be a manufacturer in British Columbia. There there are not a lot of places where you can quickly you know manufacture something, you know uh, do a test or a pilot, you know. Um, so I think there there is some opportunity potentially to maybe take some of the uh, get some manufacturing muscle or power uh, that can help startups uh, do prototypes. Um, or uh, build quickly uh, so that they can iterate quickly locally. I think one of the, that's one of the things I think would be interesting to see in the province. Yeah, I totally agree. It's one of the things I'm, I'm often asked what verticals I'm most excited by. And, and I say, I'm most excited by what the full stack developers are going to do next uh, than I am by any individual, you know, fintech, edtech, edtech. Yeah. Green tech, they're all lovely techs. What they are is someone applying software solutions to something and disrupting it in a way that builds something completely transformative and new and different. And I don't know what the next problem is. Uh, if I did, I'd be doing it. And I <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got some lovely questions in the chat. So um, uh, Nadia is asking, how did your company Edo adapt during the pandemic so you told us a bit about how you were impacted by restaurants etc but how did you as a company adapt during covid yeah i mean we you know kind of did what you know everyone else sort of did is is we kind of got uh you know real we got really focused and on what the single most important thing we could do now what could we influence um we started um thinking of ways to redesign things so that we wouldn't be so dependent on a, a, a longer on, on a supply chain. That was, you know, one of the things to repivot people. I was like, if this was to happen again or be here forever, how can our company survive? And you really made the, the sort of the, the backlog list of those things and started working on those things. And um, that that was probably the, you know, the, the number one thing. How can we reduce that dependency? and then really support each other i think that was you know uh, 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 another thing i mean it's more of a, a you know a, a qualitative thing but it it, it was re it's really hard for people you know and i think you guys all know that you know you know we're as much as i'd love you know we, you know to be in person all the time you know we couldn't and so we had to adapt and and learn to trust each other through a screen uh, learn to understand that, you know, people's uh, eight hours a day is different when you're behind a screen the whole day. And so adjusting our expectations and who we are, and now we're, we're, we're never going to go back to, uh, you know, the same way. So now we're, this, we're sort of a hybrid system. And I think we're better because of that. You know, I, I think, you know, people evolve and change and, you know, humans are resilient and we'll find a way. That's a lovely message. It's, uh, yeah, I think sometimes we have a false belief that innovation comes when we're feeling comfortable and relaxed and the creative muse comes to us. And the reality is we innovate when we need to and when we're forced to and when it's really important to. So in lots of ways, COVID forced us to innovate and I don't know that we'll go back to yeah. the way things were. Um, I've got another question from Erica, which is uh, seconded by Nadia, a lovely question. Along your career path, were there any mentors that were really influential to your professional growth? Yeah, there are many. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I had, a, you know, a mentor in Rogers. Uh, she was tremendous, uh, you know, a tremendous leader. And, and uh, what I learned from her was um, just ten tenacity. Like, I, you know, I, I was very um, tentative and she she showed me that it's okay to be assertive and so I, I i learned a lot from her at rogers abby i don't she's not rogers anymore but uh and then you know I, if i if i think through my career you know i i think i had the pleasure of working with brad smith at microsoft i mean you know you don't 
get to work that closely with someone who represented Microsoft and all the tech community uh, at the U.S. Congress. <laughs> like, you know, hearing, you know, like that that you don't get to spend that kind of time with, you know. And I really learned about diplomacy and uh, and and really about uh, our company, you know, our company, Microsoft. I, I really learned, you know, it it was doing the right things and 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 brad is doing the right things and it's unique and it's okay to do the right things and you're going to do the right things and sometimes it may not be it might look like that and it takes a few steps to get there but he was so tactical and strategic and so and i learned so much from from working with him that's been uh you know uh amazing another fellow by the name of james phillips uh you know he he was a tremendous uh, mentor around product you know, I learned a lot about product from him and how to how to deploy, you know, things at scale and how to think about things at scale and what's really important, what's noise. You know, I think that they, we all often get in in that sort of uh, you know mess at, at times. And and uh, and then and then and then Lorraine, you know, a, a wonderful uh, a manager uh, I, I had and worked with at at Microsoft, really around you know doing the right thing for people. And I think. That's always been something in, in that I've always championed people, but there's times in your ambition and in your drive that uh, that you you forget that people are not none of this is possible without people. And she always always made me think of that. That's really lovely. I um yeah, sometimes again, people often think that technology and the tech sector is all about machines and computers and software, and it's actually about people. It's about solving the problems of human beings and about um, inspiring and building the confidence and the skills and the capabilities of the teams that work for you. And if you can do those things really well, you'll build a successful company. So listen, um, I just have one final question for you, and then I'll close us out with some uh, uh, final BC Tech remarks. But let me let you have the last word. Do you have any advice? for budding entrepreneurs or startups that are just starting out and have high ambitions, what would be your piece of advice to them? Failure equals learning. <laughs> I mean, there is, there is no failure. There is only learning. That's, you know, bo bo bottom line for an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, and the second thing is uh, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. And, uh, you know, I always joke about, you know, the, you know, with my team and I've, if anyone here is, who's on the lines worked with you before, they'll roll their eyes. But I've said this for years. If I'm the smartest guy in the room, we're in trouble. <laughs> but I will make the decisions necessary because not to act is, is a risk in business. And so, so what I really want to do is surround myself with the smartest people that will challenge the status quo, will challenge what we think we're doing as a company. And then my job is really leading that uh, you know, wonderful chaotic soup into our to the point of a spear into the goal that we're go we're going to move toward, and and that's the way you know I, I I find you can move faster. But if you don't have those people smarter than you, or if you think that I'm the only person that has the answer, it will not take you far. I'm pretty sure. There's a few people in the world that have managed to do that, and uh, but there are a few people. <laughs> so I, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I love it. That's fantastic advice that's that's applicable to all of us. So thank you again. And oh, thank you for all of your insights. It was a great conversation. And thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you, Jill. Thank, thank you, everyone.